On Landline Today, salmon giant Tassel reassures Kimberley locals it will be open about its new Barramundi operation. We're looking forward to having some, um, some comprehensive and open conversations with people in the community about what's next and I guess how we can work with them. Regional Australia growing its own doctors to keep them in the bush. By bringing the training out to regional areas, that's how we're going to get more doctors staying in the area because they've become attached to the area and then they're passionate about improving the health of the local population. Now that's a shed. Is it full of trash or treasure? You be the judge. Alrighty, let's keep moving. I think we've got some junk to look at. Junk, she says. <laughs> it's not junk, it's treasure. <laughs> Hello, I'm Pip Courtney. Welcome to the program. Tassel is best known for growing salmon in Tasmania. But the company has moved into prawns in North Queensland and last year bought an ocean barramundi farm off Western Australia's remote Kimberley coast. The internationally owned salmon giant has expansion options for its barramundi operation, but as Kununurra reporter Alice Marshall found, some locals are uneasy. This is the Buccaneer Archipelago, one of Australia's most remote coastlines situated in northern WA. Wayne Foley has known these waters for decades. A Derby local, he calls the archipelago home. But he's worried things are changing. We as recreational fishers, we love this place and we love to ca catch fish up here. His ocean backyard has caught the eye of Canadian seafood giant Tassel, and they've fished out $8 million for the privilege, buying Marine Produce Australia, which runs Cone Bay Barramundi, after the company entered voluntary administration. MPA that own the barra farm in Cone Bay, where we're sitting, is uh, they went into receivership due to a, a sale that fell through. Tassel have come and snapped them up for a reasonable bargain price, I would say. So the way I see it is Tassel takes over that um, proposal to expand throughout the Kimberley. Sitting in the middle of the Kimberley Aquaculture Development Zone, Tassel will be moving into WA waters that have been marked as investment ready, with environmental checks and management policies already in place. It means commercial aquaculture operations can set up quickly without going through lengthy approvals processes. Only small. Wayne Foley is a local councillor and he's concerned that Tassal will bring with it some of the problems uh, it's experienced with salmon farming in Tasmania. In 2017, the island state's environmental watchdog ordered Tassal to destock one of its farming leases that neighbours the World Heritage Area in Macquarie Harbour. The order followed an EPA report showing conditions in the harbour had worsened with increased levels of bacteria and low levels of oxygen surrounding the Tassal ponds. With the experience of the marine park and um, some government agencies, like a lot doesn't get said and you need to physically go in and find it on the internet like I have been doing. Like, it's really hard to be informed and Mary Island Fishing Club has a right to know what's going on up here uh, because we're a stakeholder, so... And uh, we want to protect the place just as much as anyone else would. Peter George is part of the Tasmanian anti-salmon farming campaign group, Neighbours of Fish Farming. A long-time campaigner against Tassal salmon farms, He's opposed to them due to the environmental impact he believes they have and what he sees as an inherent lack of transparency in the company. The last thing you want is to have Tassal in your neighbourhood, as we have learned. We have tried over 15, 20 years to have conversations with Tassal. They'll talk to you when it suits them. They won't talk to you when it doesn't. It looks fine what Tassel is doing on the surface, if you don't mind looking at the feedlots, which are part of the largest industry operating in Tasmania, but it's what's underneath. 
The Kimberley coastline, however, does boast some very different features to that of Tasmania. Most notable are the tides. While in Tasmania, tides reach only one or two metres, at Cone Bay, they regularly get to 11 metres, allowing waste from the ponds to be swept away and diluted. Unlike Peter George, Wayne Foley isn't completely against aquaculture development in natural waterways. His concern is the development won't be properly supervised, be it by the company or by the Environmental Protection Authority. My understanding they need to sharpen up their rules. I think the EPA needs to sharpen up their rules as well. If they're going to want sustainable aquaculture, then everyone has to be on the same page. And I think monitoring is a big thing. Being up here and so far away, I would have thought maybe that might get a little bit lacklustre. So I stress that monitoring be kept up to a high standard, yeah. Their fears Tassel want to reassure locals of. We understand just how passionate people in the Kimberley are about the local environment and particularly the marine environment. We certainly um, you know, have a long history of working closely with government and the regulators and working with the scientific community about ensuring that, uh, that the local marine environment is appropriately managed. We're starting to do some of that work at the moment. We've spent some time reviewing some of the work that's been undertaken previously and that's going to form a big part of the assessments for the next stage of our operations from state and federal government. At the top level, um, Tassau has a lot of experience and is really eager to share that um, you know, with, with our Barramundi operations and make sure that we can continue to sustainably manage the, the environment in which we work. There have been questions around the viability of salmon farming in Tasmania for years, with the Federal Environment Minister warning late last year salmon farming operations in Macquarie Harbour could be temporarily halted as part of a push to save the endangered fish species, the Morgean skate. It hasn't stopped Tassal expanding. In recent years, they've moved into prawn farming in Queensland and New South Wales, and now, for the first time, into WA Barramundi. We've now rebranded the organisation from a product perspective so that not just salmon will have both the prawns and the barramundi to come under the Tassau banner at the moment. That's out in retailers at the moment. We're looking forward to leverage our great relationships with those retailers to grow the barramundi uh, brand and name um, out in stores. Uh, we think that it's a really fantastic, delicious, nutritious product for Australians. We think it's going to be one they're going to love. We want to try and make sure that we have a clear position that we can communicate with the regulators, with the community and with traditional owners who all have such an important role to play in the Kimberleys. The ABC reached out a number of times to Mayala Inninalang Aboriginal Corporation and the Kimberley Land Council who represent the traditional owners of the Buccaneer Archipelago. They declined to comment on the story. We've still got a lot of work to do to understand our next phase and once that's sort of coming to a point of completion, we're looking forward to having some, um, some comprehensive and open conversations with people in the community about what's next and I guess how we can work with them to make sure that our operation has the support of the local community and also that we work out ways to partner with traditional owner groups on things like employment, local investment and other things that make sure that we're a strong and a positive uh, force in the Kimberley. While Tassal won't say what it's planning, the previous owner of Cone Bay Barramundi Marine Produce Australia had put forward an ambitious plan to expand operations by more than tenfold to improve the viability of the business. You'll be familiar with former expansion plans that have been touted by MPA in the last couple of years. Um, we're reviewing uh, we're reviewing those at the moment and trying to make sure that we have a firm position um, that can be communicated with the community um, and with regulators and government around those. The seafood giant had planned a trip to Derby at the end of 2023. Wayne Foley offered to host the Tassal party at the Mary Island Fishing Club and was looking forward to meaningful discussions about the region's future. But it wasn't to be. Tassal cancelled the trip two weeks out, citing more pressing issues on the Tasmanian coastline and promising to reschedule. To critics like Peter George, this is an example of Tassal's failure to engage local communities. 
one of the greatest problems with TASAL and with the industry generally has been that they do not communicate with the local people. But TASAL pushes back on that notion. I think in talking about social licence, the best evidence for us is um, the communities in which we, we work. And if you look at our salmon farms in the south and west of Tassie and you look um, at prawn farms up in Mission Beach or Proserpine, we have fantastic relationships with those communities for the most part. And I look forward um, to building those relationships over in the Kimberley. In a place like Cone Bay, where locals have seen big business come and go, leaving the town of Derby no better off, there's a wariness surrounding those that make bold claims. So what kind of social licence are you going to go after in that community? Look, I think that's a really good question. Um, all I can say is that um, we work very closely with the communities we operate in, in our salmon and prawn farming operations. We have so many passionate advocates from those local communities. We invest very heavily in those community groups with local schools and sporting clubs and environmental projects. We're determined to do that in the Kimberley, in those areas with which you operate and with those traditional owner groups. We also look forward to building relationships with local suppliers and where possible uh, investing in those local communities so that they know when we're doing well, um, they'll be supported as well. I think they have the money and the power to push it through and th they also can promise a lot, which if they yeah. do, let's hope it comes true. Invasive native scrub is being touted as an energy source to fuel a biomass plant in a former coal-fired power station in the Hunter Valley. For graziers in western New South Wales who've been fighting to control the woody weeds for years, the idea of being paid to do so is a welcome one. Musselbrook reporter Amelia Bernasconi explains how it would work. The red soils of western New South Wales stretch as far as the eye can see, but so too does the invasive native scrub, a blanket term for a range of species including turpentine and butter, types of native vegetation that thrive in rangeland landscapes like this, reaching densities that take over grazing country and deplete biodiversity. Graziers like Andrew Mosley have been working to manage the weeds for years. It doesn't allow the, the, the grasses to grow, um, the, the ground's typically bare, um, the water runoff's extreme um, and, and obviously productivity's um, rock bottom. The Mosley family is on a journey to regenerate the land here at Etiwanda Station, an hour south of Cobar. They run sheep, cattle and goats across about 20,000 hectares. So far, they've managed to return about 4,000 hectares to productive grasslands, dramatically improving the amount of livestock they can run. Yeah, there's a heap of goats in the timber here. It's chalk and cheese, it's, you know, double to three times, but it's not, that's not the only benefit um, there's, you know, biodiversity to depend on those, those soft-seeded perennials. There's, you know, birds and insects and lizards that, um, that need, need a food source. But it's costly and time-consuming to manage the invasive native scrub, all done under state government guidelines. Andrew says it's a full-time job within itself. People typically lay it down with machinery, so it, it chains and bulldozers, and then push it into heaps. Uh, and then, then burn it and put it back into the atmosphere. So it's, mm. um, if we can find an alternative use for it, it would be fantastic. And now there might be a way to spin a dollar from the invasive scrub. Anywhere where you're burning anything, really, in my view, it should be putting into a power station creating electricity. Mm. 
And that's what Richard Poole, the CEO of renewable energy asset and technology developer, Verdant Earth Technologies, plans to do. The company bought this former coal-fired power station, Red Bank, near Singleton in the Hunter Valley in 2018 and plans to turn it into a 151 megawatt biomass generator. So if you want a like-for-like -like generation replacement for coal, it's a biomass generator. It delivers on 24-7, it actually supports wind and solar and batteries and it really gives Australia the energy security it can need, utilising our massive natural resources. Andrew is one of four farmers who are ready and could start their supply tomorrow and between them they have enough biomass to fuel Red Bank for up to five years. So it's about 60, 69 trucks a day uh, coming in here and uh, it'll power about 200,000 homes. Traditionally in Australia, coal-fired power has underpinned the energy grid. But in the past decade, 10 coal generators have closed. Right, I shut another one, 50% closed. The Australian energy market operator says Australia's remaining coal-fired power stations and their combined 21 gigawatt capacity will retire within the next 15 years. With that, AMO is forecasting an energy shortfall from as early as next year. We're on a decarbonisation journey and we're hurtling full steam ahead. Uh, so basically what we need to do is anything and everything. Um, we need as much solar, wind and renewable energy as possible, as well as the renewable energy generation. We also need storage, things like batteries, potentially pumped hydro, so that we can access and use energy when we need to. Dr Jessica Allen is a senior lecturer in chemical and renewable energy engineering at the University of Newcastle. She says biomass has never played a huge part in Australia's energy mix, but the Red Bank opportunity is unique. For Red Bank, that plant already exists. A large amount of the upfront emissions, as well as cost, is already there because the power station exists. You don't have to add anything into it. I would be surprised to see biomass used for electricity generation large scale in Australia, mostly because it is difficult for that harvesting, processing and central facility. Uh, and that all of the costs of that add up. Um, and if you're looking at a cost basis, solar and wind are very cheap, very available. The Red Bank restart is facing some opposition. The Nature Conservation Council's Jackie Mumford says the transition to renewables has been lagging, but biomass is not the solution. There is a lot of concern among the community about this project, uh, you know, largely to do with tree clearing and the impacts that that will have on the local environment, but also to do with climate change, with creating emissions that are going to drive, drive climate change. And then there's the issue of air pollution. You know, burning timber products is a huge issue for air pollution. It creates PM 2.5 particles in the atmosphere, uh, which we know is associated with a raft of res respiratory problems. So it's, it's really bad for the environment, it's bad for the climate and it's bad for people's health. Verdant Earth rejects that. You obviously can't convince everyone of everything, but I think you've got to have a social licence. So we're not taking any of the uh, residues from native forestry. So we've made a conscious decision that, uh, you know, people have a, a view on that and we respect that view. So from our point of view, we're chasing more the invasive native scrub. Any actual uh, land clearing or road clearing, for example, the Hexham Bypass is being cleared uh, this year, I think it is. So there'll be, uh, you know, timber coming out of that that could be used to create energy. Uh, a lot of this stuff just gets burnt anyway. But Dr Allen stresses using waste biomass is key. Because what happens when you leave biomass to decompose or if it's in a landfill or if it's left on the ground somewhere, you can actually start to form methane as a greenhouse gas, which has about 25 times the impact of carbon dioxide in terms of greenhouse effect. Uh, so you can actually have a worse outcome if you allow the biomass to just decompose and to sit in a landfill compared to cleanly combusting it to make a pure carbon dioxide stream. Verdant Earth claims the power station will be a net zero operation. The long term plan is to grow their own fuel on their own land, complementing the native scrub from western New South Wales. And in the meantime, we'll be developing with you know, various mines around this area. What can we do in terms of grow your own product? And that helps them because it helps them reduce their emissions and it helps us. And with grow your own, just so everyone knows, just to finish that is what actually happens is you end up with a negative carbon profile because we create 
we store carbon in the roots whilst we create a perpetual crop on the top which we can use as net zero fuel. That will reduce transport costs and emissions on initial plans to truck wood chips from the Cobar region about seven hours to the Hunter Valley. Down the track, Verdant wants to build smaller scale generators closer to places like Cobar. Dr Allen says there are plenty of caveats to be considered before labelling Red Bank a net zero plant. So definitely way better than coal when you're looking at in terms of an emission penalty. Uh, whether it's better than solar and wind really depends on those questions around how it's harvested, how it's processed and what the comparative use of the biomass is. Well, the edge Verdant has is that the power station already exists and it's relatively new. To build something like this from scratch today is estimated to cost around $720 million, more than double than the cost of a wind or solar farm of the same megawatt output. But to transform a once coal-fired generator to a biomass plant, Verdant says will cost around $80 million. And once government approvals are gained, the company says it could be up and running within 12 months. This is an opportunity that has been sitting here looking at everybody in the face and we're not doing anything about it. General Manager Costa Tsiolkas was part of the initial construction of Red Bank in the 1990s. We only have to make a couple of conveyor adjustments to make sure that the flow of the biomass to the boiler is, is correct. The storage bins have trouser legs, which is very conical legs. Typically that block up with biomass, so we're going to make those round and cylindrical all the way down. And those are the major changes. No changes to the combustion furnace other than adjusting the fuel-air ratios, which is you can only do that once you're running and it's like tuning a car. Public consultation on the project has just closed and the decision currently sits with the New South Wales government, which declined to comment for this story. Back at Cobar, Andrew knows this opportunity to get paid for his cleared invasive native scrub is not a sure thing. But that won't stop the third generation farmer from continuing to improve his property. We're extremely proud of what we've done with the landscape. It's healthier, it's more resilient, it's, it's more productive. We're replacing a problem native species with a, with a beneficial native species. So we're not, it's not about broad scale clearing and turning it into cropping country, it's about dealing with an issue. Um, it's about providing opportunities for the next gener generation and if they want to be involved, and that would be a fa fantastic outcome. And the next generation certainly wants to. I absolutely love it, it's in the blood. I've been away for um, high school and, and university, but just kept getting drawn back out here and, yeah, got a real passion for it. Incredibly proud of um, what they've done here and just the evidence that you can see of the landscape improving and flourishing just really warms your heart. It's, it's pretty exciting. It's... Coming up on Landline, can university medical courses in the regions ease the shortage of rural doctors? There's very good evidence that if you do all of your medical school training in a rural setting and do your internship, you have a much higher chance of staying in a rural setting. Hi, I'm Kath Sullivan. A legal challenge has been mounted in the federal court over a mining company's proposed carbon capture project in the Great Artesian Basin. Queensland's farm lobby group, Agforce, says if the project goes ahead, irreversible damage could be caused to Australia's biggest underground freshwater reservoir. The gap stretches across four states, but in 2022, the then Environment Minister determined the proposal to pump carbon dioxide waste underground in Queensland did not need the assessment of the Commonwealth. A determination the farmers hope the court will overturn. We don't want to be in court, but we have no choice. And what we have here is a proposal by a company to literally take a dump in our water source. Water is life. If they poison our water, the farm, it, it's the town's gone, farms are gone, animals are dead. Glencore won't comment specifically on the case, but says the campaign opposing its project is misleading. It says the trial will not put agricultural or drinking water at risk. A hearing is set down for August, while the proposal is also subject to a Senate inquiry and Queensland approval. 
Thousands of Australian sheep and cattle on board a live export ship have arrived in Israel more than three months after it first set sail. The MV Bahija sailed from Fremantle on January 5, bound for Jordan, but was ordered by the Australian government to turn around 15 days into the voyage. That was due to increased security concerns in the Red Sea. The vessel returned and livestock were discharged at the port of Fremantle until early March, when a consignment was approved to sail via South Africa's Cape of Good Hope. The department says the livestock have now been successfully unloaded in good health, with mortalities on board below the notifiable limit. Farmers on Tasmania's King Island are dealing with their driest start to autumn in more than 100 years. Jan van Roswijk says he's tipped out roughly 70 millimetres of rain for the year so far, when he'd typically expect to bank up to 200 by now. It is a bit challenging. It's one that we haven't really struck. You know, so I suppose you might say we've been a little bit um, spoilt, in, you know, is over, over the years. So it's a, it's a real, it's a real wake up call, really. The weather has decided that uh, King Island is like a snow plough, but yeah, it just seems to go over the top or below us. Greg Morris says about 80% of the water holes on his farm have now dried up. Compounding issues for the island's producers is a lack of shipping options to take livestock off the island and bring in much-needed fodder. We don't really want to paint a picture of doom and bloom, but we have got some logistic issues. Um, it wouldn't be such a poor state if we were able to move more cattle earlier, and that's why we sort of run everyone's run out of feed. Um, a lot of people are trying to get cattle off for, and sheep, particularly uh, for quite some time. So that's exacerbated the shortage of feed, but it is very dry. These photos from his farm show how dry it is. Native vegetation dying is a good indication that, yeah, the pastures have been knocked around pretty hard. Greg Morris says there's been a 40% increase in the number of cattle leaving the island in the past quarter. But if farmers could, they would be sending a lot more. If we could have got another 30 or 40% off, before we had actually completely extinguished all our pastures, um, we would have had a better chance of getting into winter with less hand feeding um, because the actual fodder, due to the poor spring, there's very there's no there's no reserve of fodder on the island. The Tasmanian government recently announced it would support a second sailing each week between Devonport and King Island's Grassy Port, up from once per week until the middle of May. One of Australia's largest wineries, Casella Family Brands, uses more electricity than some small towns, but it's now drawing some of that energy from the sun. The company has built a $10 million solar farm as part of a commitment to be net zero by 2050. So this solar facility will offset about 7,800 tonne of CO2. That's equivalent to planting 325,000 trees. And finally today, she delivered more consecutive race wins than any other horse in the world. Now Wink's first foal has secured her own entry into the history books, selling for a world record price of $10 million. At 10 million, take 500 more. At 10 million, last chance, done. If she can't get to the racetrack, she'll be an amazing mum. She's Australian forever and she's going to be just fabulous. For another week, that's Landline News. The shortage of rural doctors has compromised the health of people living outside our major cities for decades. But it's hoped basing medical schools in rural and regional Australia will change that. As research shows, doctors who train in country areas are more likely to stay there. Broken Hill reporter Bill Ormond travelled across New South Wales for this story. Deniloquin straddles the Edward River in southwestern New South Wales. Known for agriculture and its annual ute muster, it has a population of around 7,000. Like many regional centres, there's been plenty of change in recent decades and local health advocate Pam Elliman has seen much of it in her 54 years here. 
With several GP clinics and a hospital in town, Deniliquin is fairly well resourced. But even then, there's still trouble finding a regular doctor. There's probably three in one, four in another, two in another. But those doors are locked. If you came to Deniliquin tomorrow to leave, you couldn't get into them. And that is our biggest issue. It's an area highlighted in the recent New South Wales Rural, Regional and Remote Health Inquiry. During 15 hearings across the state over 11 months, witnesses repeatedly told the inquiry about their experiences in waiting weeks and months to see GPs and specialists. It also found people living outside of the city have significantly poorer health outcomes, greater incidence of chronic disease and greater premature deaths. There's so many aspects to be having a healthy community and we've just got to look at all avenues and try and get, get people to fill the bill and help us out in this community. Three hours east in the regional city of Wagga Wagga, the next generation of rural doctors are hard at work. Atrial thrombus on a background of a mitral valve replacement and an aortic valve replacement. These fifth year students are part of the University of New South Wales Rural Medical School, which officially opened in 2021. It means all six years of the degree can be completed in the Riverina. But he'd been in the um, in hospital since the start of February. It's a shift from the past when only students in their later years could attend the UNSW Wagga Wagga campus. Prior to 2000, there were no rural clinical schools. Many students went through all of their university degree and never got a chance to actually experience rural life or they were only there for four weeks. So they might have experienced the clinical medicine but they didn't experience the community. When Professor Tara McKenzie arrived in Wagga for a placement 20 years ago, she instantly fell in love with it was told staying here would be a mistake. Quite a lot of the senior doctors in Sydney will actually say you don't want to go rural, you don't want to go regional. When I came to Wagga I was told I was throwing my career away. Now nothing could be further from the truth but when you're hearing that as a junior doctor unfortunately that can also influence where you choose to go. Students will spend countless hours in this state-of-the-art training facility throughout their degrees. Wagga Medical School is one of several locations which have opened across New South Wales in recent years where students can complete the full degree regionally, including another UNSW campus in Port Macquarie alongside a Charles Sturt University school located in Orange. Here in the Riverina, the majority of the 100 students are from the country. Each year that we've been running the whole six years in Wagga, this is year four this year, we have noticed increased numbers of local students. It's hoped these rurally based schools encourage more students to stay regionally once they complete their degrees and choose a specialty. There's very good evidence that if you do all of your medical school training in a rural setting and do your internship, you have a much higher chance of staying in a rural setting no matter where you are rurally. kilometres up the road and nestled in these mountainous ranges is Gundagai. Divided by the mighty Murrumbidgee River and surrounded with lush hills dotted with cattle. The area is home to rural medical school graduate Dr Maggie Kate Minogue. Maggie Kate grew up in nearby Harden before moving hundreds of kilometres away to Sydney to study. So when I was looking at university options was really looking at Sydney because Sydney and Newcastle actually they were the only places that offered undergraduate medicine. She missed the rural lifestyle and after hearing about the Wagga Wagga campus it was an opportunity she couldn't pass on. Once I found out about that I there was nothing stopping me from going I was getting there. Maggie Kate is one of the first adopters of the Murrumbidgee single employer model. It allows her to split her time between this private medical practice and the hospital while not having to deal with the stress of negotiating multiple contracts. It meant that I could utilise some study leave and prepare for my exams. Uh, it meant that if I needed to I could take maternity leave. Um, but it meant that I also had additional people in my corner. As a rural generalist, Maggie Kate has more training when it comes to emergency and procedural skills. The diversity of work was also an incentive. There's so much variety in what we get 
anything could walk through the door. In any given day, I can go from cradle to grave. She believes the single employer model alongside rural medical schools will play a critical role in helping diminish the rural doctor shortage in future. I think there is a lot of optimism about future training pathways and encouraging the, the upcoming students, both in the high school level but also in the university level, to embrace rural culture and to stay rural while training. Long-term medical student placements are also a way of helping bring doctors to the bush. Research by the University of Queensland released last year showed those who complete a 12-week placement combined with a two-year training program are seven times more likely to stay in a small rural or remote location. In Broken Hill, in remote outback New South Wales, a group of fifth-year medical students from the University of Adelaide are proof of the potential success of these placements. Sebastian Baker grew up in the leafy green outskirts of Adelaide's hills. At the start of this year actually I was thinking more so going into physician training so that's like doctors that work just in hospitals on the wards and then I decided to give rural fifth year a go um, and I was really exposed to this idea of rural generalism which is an idea that you're trained a bit more broadly. As part of his year in Broken Hill, he's spent time working in the hospital and with organisations like the Royal Flying Doctors Service, where he finds himself today. Where are you going? I'm going to Bali. To Bali? Yeah. He says the time spent in the remote outback city has made the idea of working in the bush more attractive. It encouraged it 100%. I didn't really think of it as a serious option until I came up here. And now, like I said, I'm thinking that might be my career. He's not alone. Fellow University of Adelaide student Marnie McFarlane grew up in the remote South Australian town of Cowell on the Eyre Peninsula. Start compressions and get a tube or an LMA going. With a population of around a thousand and no regular doctor, the 22-year-old felt drawn to medicine. The doctors here are more willing to give you a go at things to be a bit more hands-on, but so are the patients. We um, quite often get patients say like, Oh, like let, let the student do it. Um, even things that we're not, we're not really, we don't really feel like we're capable of doing. I guess. A year of being thrown in the deep end has accelerated her growth. Even like thinking about internship, I'm already looking at applying remote, rural. I don't think that I would even consider working in Adelaide after I graduate or in the city after I graduate. So it's definitely just reiterated that I want to do it. The placement has Marnie already planning her path post-graduation. It's music to the ears of Nola Wyman, who works for Far West Aboriginal Health Service provider Marima. And uh, what's really important is um, having students coming out here as well. With decades of experience, she understands the challenges of attracting and retaining doctors better than most. It's absolutely wonderful. You know, the lifestyle out here, the experience you get out here, in the far west Broken Hill and doing you know, placement in Menindi and in Wilcannia. Nola knows the importance of getting young doctors through the door and how that impacts their willingness to work remotely. And I think you get more of a, a great experience in regards to then how you deal with your clients, how you keep in contact with your clients, your relationship with your clients. And I think that makes you or will make you a far better practitioner in the long run. GP Madison Kane came to Marama as a medical student before returning later as a graduate. Even though it was only for six months initially, I've stayed for a total of 20. Broken Hill I found to be a really vibrant community. Um, it's got some fantastic uh, health services. Even though she didn't study at a rural medical school, she grew up in country Victoria. Madison is a big advocate for the change they've created alongside increased clinical placements. So the pathways for a rural person to become a doctor um, has become more streamlined in recent years um, through various access initiatives as well as the establishment of rural clinical schools. Medicine's really hard to get into and so if people were told you can have a spot but you're going to be living rurally, they would take that over not getting in. Um, so I think that like that's a good encouragement and then they might find that they'll love it and end up staying. <laughs> Professor Tara McKenzie hopes the regionally based schools can continue to grow interest in rural medicine. 
She'd like to see those in charge of specialist colleges also reconsider how and where they offer their training. And at the moment, unfortunately, apart from psychiatry, the only other specialty program that you can do all of your training in rurally is GP. And so therefore, if you want to be any other type of specialist, you are forced at the moment to go for a significant part of your training to a city, a metropolitan city. If they could do eight of their 10 years in a rural place or a regional place and just go back to the metropolitan for the part that they need, then that is when you're going to see people stay. While there are many more hurdles to overcome doctor shortages in regional Australia, there's hope that these schools and rural placements could be the catalyst for inspiring change in the next generation of country doctors. I think it's going to be a win-win for all communities. I have great faith in it. I think it's a great initiative. It's an incredibly stimulating and rewarding career and um, the more people that we have from rural areas going back to rural areas, the better the health of the Australian people. G'day, I'm Matt Brand. The United States is famous for its love of hamburgers, but after years of drought, the US cattle herd is at its lowest point since the 1950s, so supply is tight, and here's what's happening to prices. Lean beef trimmings, the key to making those good burgers, has this month reached a record price in the US. It's forcing the states to increasingly turn to other countries for its grinding beef, and it's ordering a lot from us. The price of imported product from Australia is rising sharply. And in the first quarter of this year, overall beef exports to the US have surged to their highest level since 2015. So what does all of this mean for the average Aussie cattle producer going forward? I spoke to Ripley Atkinson from Stonex. There's a few things sort of creating this really interesting dynamic, which people have been keeping an eye on for some time here in Australia. The main thing really is the reduction in the number of um, cattle processed in the United States, which meets that lean beef trimming specification. Those volumes are down about 12% uh, for the corresponding four weeks compared to last year, and 25% compared to the corresponding volumes in 2022. So that gives you an idea of reduction in supply. And obviously with cost of living pressures in the US at the minute, Consumers are consistently turning to, to mince, obviously, and, and hamburgers and those type of things to, to be enjoying at home. And that demand is still robust, supply is lower, that therefore influences price. So, Ripley, at Wagga this week, the National Livestock Reporting Service said that cows stole the show with a big number of processors all bidding keenly to acquire cows in all weight categories. How much of that is because of what's happening in the US, do you think? When you look at the Australian uh, processor cow prices, and that's ultimately the product that will meet that lean beef trimming specification, if you will, for, for going into the American market, there are genuine signs of the influence of the American price change and the demand for our product because we're price so much cheaper, which is which makes us really competitive. There is genuine evidence to suggest that that situation is starting to play out. And, and the demand for Australian lean beef trimmings is filtering back to the actual physical animals that we, we sell on the market here in Australia. And, and you can see that despite high supply. So supply of those animals to markets actually increased, but, but price has also reacted positively and lifted this week. It tells you that the processors and exporters are recognising the opportunity, are wanting to send product into the US and are competing heavily in, you know, in market to, um, to purchase those animals to, to meet that US demand. And reports of bird flu getting into the dairy herd over in the US, does that risk derailing all of this? The way I'm communicating it to people is we all remember in 2022, both as you know, average everyday Australians and the beef industry, the concerns around foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease uh, entering Bali in Indonesia, that had a really averse impact on, on livestock markets, not only cattle, but sheep and goats also, for a period of about six to eight weeks in 2022. 
what you're seeing now with this outbreak of avian flu in America, which has infected uh, a dairy worker and uh, is in older lactating dairy cows, it is a very significant shock to, to the market. That's what you call it. It's an emotional shock. It's influenced their futures prices and it's also influencing sort of the current cash market, if you will. The challenge is really understanding what all of this means and talking to our US counterparts, it needs more time to unravel to really understand what the influence is. At the minute, this situation is placing natural downward pressure on, on both spot market cattle prices and futures cattle prices in the US. Um, as sort of time unravels, and the situation sort of finds a bit of stable ground, we'll then have a better understanding of what it looks like. When you think about Australia, cattle markets recovered very, very quickly in 2022 following the foot and mouth disease concerns from Indonesia. There is the potential for that to happen, but the concern from the US rancher and the US beef industry is lack of export market access because of concerns around biosecurity. And then obviously also the domestic United States consumer choosing to move away from beef because of their worry about avian flu. That's Ripley Atkinson from Stonex. Now on the topic of beef, but very much at the other end of the scale, check out this steak, which took out the top honours at this year's Wagyu branded beef competition. This full blood Wagyu with 60% marbling comes from Mayura Station in South Australia. The judges said it had exceptional melt in your mouth juiciness with lasting umami flavours and a satisfying silky mouth feel. Mayura also topped the elite Wagyu sale this week with this heifer fetching $130,000. It was snapped up by the Thomas family who run Wagyu cattle in the United States. In the domestic sale yards this week, numbers were up, prices were firm and as mentioned, cows stole the show with processors bidding heavily. Following rain and last week's jump in prices, sheep and lamb yardings increased by 82%. It was the biggest weekly yarding since February and prices sort of buckled under the weight of those numbers. Back from its Easter break, the wool market was again under pressure. AWI says Chinese top makers took advantage of the cheaper conditions. In New York, cotton futures fell to a three-month low and sugar continued its downward trend. In Chicago, soybean futures fell away amid news that demand from China is slow. In Australia, the sorghum price of Brisbane went up again following recent rain and downgrading, which we spoke about last week. The rising price of crude oil, just one of the reasons why canola continues to soar. And finally, well done to grain grower Nathan Pate and his team who have produced a record-breaking crop of corn. Harvested near Token Wall in southern New South Wales, it's the highest yielding corn crop ever produced in Australia, going beyond 23.2 tonnes per hectare, which beats the previous record by more than a tonne. That is the Landline Check on prices. Keep it rural. Hello, I'm Tim Lee. Next week on Landline, a special Anzac Day story. Out of the tragedy of war, one family's generous gift to the nation and to agricultural research. Last year, we showed you a pretty fancy shed in northern New South Wales. Well, we found another one. It's in the hinterland of Queensland's Sunshine Coast, and shed boss Steve Ralph assures me it is not full of rusty junk. You be the judge. The Glasshouse Mountains is one of Queensland's most stunning locations. Camera operators love filming here, but... Hey Ed, I know it's pretty out there, but we're here to film the shed. 
Oh, is that? OK, these guys. OK, I know it's pretty, but... This is an inside shoot with Cobb & Co history buff Steve Ralph. Here we are on the shed. Steve sent in a video inviting Landline to visit so he could show off his impressive shed. When we arrived, he was working alongside his two offsiders, John and Keith, and his son, Derek. Yeah, that one a bit harder, Derek. That's it. In the shed, which he built in stages, Steve repairs, restores and rebuilds vintage horse-drawn carriages, carts and sulkies. It's home to an impressive collection of tools and machines. A mix of bought, bequeathed, donated and scavenged. Just another spoke in the wheel. He can build anything. He's a tool maker by trade and with that um, experience, he can build anything at all. How talented is he? Really good, really. If he says he can do something, he'll do it, yeah. And if he hasn't got a machine or he can't find one... He'll make one. <laughs> Steve's obsession with Cobb & Co started with this carriage. Using modern and old-time trade skills, he took it from rotten and in pieces to a fully functioning as-new coach. That's that card coming, Keith, just about there. Yeah, it's coming good. 30 years ago, John Groves asked Steve for help restoring an old sulky. There you go, there's one. Still mates, John pops in once a week, and he's more than muscle. Why have you got the nickname The Scrounger? Well, if Steve's after something he can't find it, I can normally find it for him. And what percentage of stuff in piles is junk here? Or is that a rude word in this shed, well, junk? if you can't get it anymore, it's not junk. And a lot of this stuff is not made anymore, so hang on to what you've got, otherwise there's nothing else. Another mate, Keith Schultz, is a regular visitor. The wet's broken too, you know, Keith. Yeah. So that's how you get away with it. <laughs> Do the three of you enjoy each other's company when you're yeah. working in the shed? Yeah, yeah. Watch out for snakes. A bit of bull goes on, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's pretty good. Talk about old times and yeah. The Cobb and Co obsession has occupied Steve and his loyal helpers for five years, working on this. It's a replica of a monster horse-drawn carriage called the Leviathan, which worked the Geelong Ballarat line in 1860. So how many people could fit in and on the Leviathan? Well, 75 all up. 36 on the roof. And how many in...? 20 men in the back, 16 women in the front, and three up with the driver. When the wheels are fitted, this giant, which needed eight horses to pull it, will weigh six tons. Can I have a look inside? In the Certainly men's can. section? In the men's section? <laughs> You'll be right. <laughs> so this is the men's section? Yes, you're very privileged to be in it. Yes. <laughs> like the driver could cop a fine, you know. Oh, really? How much has it cost you so far? I'd hate to add it up, but somewhere around 300000 but if you split that over five or six years or something, it's all I earn. I just, whatever I earn, I put into it. Steve wants to finish the Leviathan this year and then take it to schools. So Cobb & Co isn't forgotten. Well, Cobb & Co was the world's largest coaching firm. They were the first company that started franchising. They had 600 coaches, 60,000 horses. If there's a company to be studied, the ingenuity. <laughs> Steve suffers from an affliction common in rural Australia. He thinks he needs a bigger shed. Well, I think it's about 60 metres long and 30 metres wide, but it's not big enough. I need a bigger Stop one. Stop it. Stop it. So what's over here? Let's have a look. I was quite taken with the blacksmithing bay. Yeah. That's the smallest anvil I've ever seen. Why is that special? Well, no wheelwright left that to me in his will. How old would that be? 1840 and never had the electric motor on, run by a steam engine. Wow, and it's still yes, useful? Yes, still, still useful. 
And when he couldn't find a machine to bend metal into circles for wheels, he made this. The retired toolmaker has some serious skills. So is that your theory? If you can't scrounge it or buy it, you'll, you can make it? I can make it. All righty. Let's keep moving. I think we've got some junk to look at. Junk, junk she says. <laughs> it's not junk, it's treasure. <laughs> What do you think, genius or junk collector? If you've got a shed you think's worth sharing, please let us know. And that's the show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget you can catch up anytime on iView. I'll leave you with the weekly weather update. Bye for now. Hello from the Bureau with your weather app for Sunday the 14th of April. A high pressure system over the bight continues to bring mostly settled weather to large parts of Australia this weekend. Good news for areas of New South Wales and Queensland where floodwaters are still receding in the wake of last week's rain. The exception to the settled weather is a few showers across western Tasmania, the northern New South Wales coastal fringe and the far northern tropics. Cloud lingers over southern inland western Australia as well, but minimal rainfall is expected from any storms that may develop. Tomorrow we'll start with morning fogs in the south, then another cool to mild, mostly clear day across much of mainland Australia. A few showers about the northern New South Wales coast, with wet weather beginning to increase in the tropical north as well. Later tomorrow, a cold front will approach the southeast, bringing further cool, wet weather to Tasmania and southern Victoria into Tuesday morning. At the same time, we'll see increasing showers across far north Queensland, with the risk of moderate falls about the north tropical coast. Saturated conditions may lead to renewed river rises in some parts. Around midweek, showers and storms will become more extensive across eastern New South Wales and southeast Queensland, mainly about the coast, but possibly returning to parts of southern inland Queensland as well. At this stage, no significant rainfall is forecast over the flood affected areas. Thursday, wet and stormy weather will continue to impact the top end, northern Queensland and the east coast. Cool with patchy showers and drizzle across southeast Australia, but clearer and more settled for central and south Australia. In the west, sunny skies and warming temperatures will dominate. By Friday and heading into next weekend, there will be no huge shift in this weather pattern. Showers will persist in the east and the tropical north with broadly settled conditions elsewhere. That's it for this week. We'll see you next Sunday.